So I'm going to talk to you today about the imaging of lumbar spinal stenosis, and we'll talk a little bit about imaging combined with some of the, the clinical components of it. So most of the, uh, the spinal stenosis will be very uh, localized. It will be localized to 3, 4, and 4, 5. The rest of the levels are, are fairly protected. Uh, the clinical presentation, Ram already discussed, we'll go over this a little bit. Uh, the severity, this is what we'll talk about mainly in terms of how you correspond the imaging severity to the clinical severity. And I'll uh, introduce uh, one of the algorithms. So this is a degenerative cascade. So typically what goes first, what degenerates first, disc or facets? Disc. And then you have abnormal disc motion that translates into abnormal facet motion. The gliding motion goes to a rocking motion. The force gets transmitted to the back. Facets hypertrophy, the disc bulges. Then you get a trefoil shape or a triangular shape. It narrows from a circular shape, shape to a triangular shape. This is a hypertrophy ligament of flavum. This is what you'll take off using the minimally invasive lumbar decompression, right? Uh, this is what was demonstrated to a great expertise previous in the lab by Dr. Gandhi. So the bulging disc and the narrowing of the spinal canal, and this is how the cookie crumbles for lumbar spinal stenosis. Some of the secondary signs you absolutely must know for spinal stenosis detection because the sagittal view notoriously underestimates the degree of narrowing. Redundancy and crowding of the nerve roots. Anytime this looks like a little piece of redundant spaghetti, that's severe stenosis because the uh, cauda equina has been stretched. Facet joint gapping, this has to be recognized because when this, this person stands up, this goes forward and the whole thing is compressed. I remember doing myelograms uh, a long time ago, big East Coast hospital and myelography machine would spin it around, work with the great Bob Gaylor, and he would say, now we're going to see the spinal stenosis. The machine would take the patient up, set them down, the spinal thesis would go forward, and you could see the canal pinch on, on x-ray, myelography. Never forgot that. It's a very visual uh, example of spinal stenosis. And then the, the ligament and flavum slants up to, from posterior to ventrally inferior and has a different appearance. And so here's what it looks like in the upper part, more ligamentum and more protrusion into the canal that makes it, takes it from a triangular shape to a real trefoil shape. Uh, that's from the botany world, that word. And this is a triangular shape for the lower portion of the ligament. As I mentioned, spinal stenosis will be three, four, four, five. If somebody says, I've got a patient with spinal stenosis at five, one that I want to put a spacer in, I want to do mild. My first response is uh, no. Right? No. 5 1 typically. Transitional lumbosacral anatomy? Okay. But conventional anatomy, you don't get stenosis at, at 5 1. 2 3 and 1 2 are relatively protected. And the reason why you get spinal anesthesis at the lower levels is because uh, the spinal anesthesis will produce the stenosis. It gives rise to symptoms. And this is, I took this from a really old book. And this shows you how long spinal stenosis has been around. The old men with the cane that are bent over, how many of those guys have spinal stenosis? The answer is all of them, right? They all do. This is ubiquitously common. So as pain with standing, as pain with walking, the worse, uh, the more you walk, the worse it gets, and it's relieved with sitting down or stopping, especially with forward flexion. Whenever it gets severe, people will have to put their hands on the chairs or the walls to stabilize because when it gets severe, they'll lose their proprioception. How long do you have to take before you uh, decompress when somebody starts to get leg weakness? Because the more advanced it will become, uh, they'll start to get weak legs and then eventually they'll lose their ability to walk. So this is controversial, but a kind of a good rule of thumb, if you were to have a rule of thumb, by the time you start to get leg weakness with spinal stenosis, you have about six months before uh, the person's that neurologic deficit will become permanent. So about six months to decompress. And so this, this is an incredibly common thing that's been around in a very long time. So numbers wise, and this is based on the uh, Swedish data, Scandinavian spinal stenosis data, is about 77 cubic millimeters is, or square, square millimeters, is about the distance there's Everyone is stenotic and has symptoms. That's absolute stenosis. But that's the, the very uh, border of that segment. So if you remember 85 uh, square millimeters, this is absolute stenosis. 
So the ligament of flavum is about two millimeters in size. Whenever it's hypertrophied, it's about four millimeters in size. So 85 millimeters, two and four, it's all you need to remember if you're gonna remember anything. If you're not very good at remembering things, and the way that you get the, the area is, is pi times A plus times B. This is the, and, and, and this actually is built into our AI algorithm reader. It calculates the square area. Uh, we use an AI reader called uh, Columbo, which is a great name, right? <laughs> great name. And so here's, and what, what scale do people use for spinal stenosis? Does anybody use a scale for spinal stenosis? Or uh, what, 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 which one of these grading systems do you use? Does anybody didn't know the name of a single grading system? How many grading systems are there? There are nine. Does anybody know the name of a single one? No. Why? Because it's not really important, right? This is Shizus, this is Gwen. Whether it's a Shizus grade C or Gwen grade G, the commonality by the time the patient starts to get symptoms is when there's no more fluid around the cauda equina. And that's really something that you can take home from the MRI. So the grading system isn't important. This is a framinal grading system from Lee, but that's not important. So let's take a look at these. I and mean, this is a nice round shape. It's not even triangular. Front to back, it measures 12 millimeters. Uh, area is greater than 100 square millimeters, and this is fine. This is a good, young, healthy, normal, uh, good-looking spine, just like we all have in this room. This is all of our spine, right there, is an example. But it, when you start to age, uh, it becomes triangular in shape, and the front to back uh, measurement becomes right at, right at 12, maybe a little bit, starts to get a little bit less but it maintains its area. This is still round, but the outside border of this starts to get triangular shaped with the uh, posterior bulging of the intervertebral disc. And so moderate stenosis, you have about 10 to 12 millimeters from front to back. The shape goes from round to triangular. Some people call this a trefoil shape. And then ligamentum flavum is not thin and gracile anymore. It starts to thick up. And this is about three millimeters. And by the time you get to severe, it's really triangular. Sometimes you have the secondary signs of stenosis because when this person step, this stands up, the rest of this CSF is going to go away. I told you a good rule of thumb is that the person will be symptomatic if there's no uh, fluid around the cauda equina. So this, this has fluid around the cauda equina, but I'm call, calling this severe. Well, it's severe for two reasons. Number one, the measurement the surface area, the area of the canal. The second thing is secondary signs. When this person stands up, all of that fluid is going to go out. And we, some people have the advantage of having an upright MRI. You can actually see this on imaging, and it's a great demonstration of that. So some of the other symptoms, signs, uh, imaging signs, uh, this redundancy of the nerves this, and I mentioned that the sagittal view will underestimate the stenosis, and that's very true. Whenever you have a redundant cauda equina, that means it's stretched because of the person's stenosis. That's a really good sign of stenosis, and you know it's pretty severe. This is epidural lipomatosis. So there's a couple things about this. Some people believe it's a contraindication to epidural injections because for some reason the uh, epidural injectant won't get around the nerves. That's just pish posh, that's not true, right? This epidural uh, lipomatosis is soft. You can inject around it, but it will if you have enough, especially in somebody with Cushing's disease, chronic steroids, uh, tremendous morbid obesity, you get epidural lipomatosis that can be symptomatic and can start to compress the spinal canal. And the location of spinal stenosis is important. We don't just have one location. We talk about canal, 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 but there's also lateral recesses as the nerve goes out and starts to exit under the pedicle. This is the lateral recess, this is the central canal. Then you have foraminal stenosis right here in this area. So you have three primary areas where you can get stenosis. And so this is a case, 95 uh, square millimeters. Is this symptomatic or not? What do you, what do you think about that? It's not. This was not symptomatic, although it's pretty narrow. There's fluid around the nerve roots. There's lateral recess right more than left. And this is one of those borderline cases I showed, but the facets look okay. 
And, you know, this may be a disc herniation that's resorbing, resolving. So you know, these are the kind of things you have to look at, primary and secondary signs of stenosis, to get good at determining. So my guess, if I saw this, probably not symptomatic. If he's going to be symptomatic, he's going to have a right-sided reticulopathy that's positional dependent, right? And that's pretty much what it was. So the border of the epidural space is between halfway up the pedicle and the superior portion of the pars. That's where you'll have your interlaminar space on the lateral view. And here's an example of an injectate in the epidural space. And see how narrow this is as compared to how wide it is up there? And that's a good example of spinal stenosis on a lateral fluoroscopic view. And this, I'm not, not going to talk about it all, thank God. I mean, look at the algorithm. But this is part of the, the missed uh, criteria, and this is uh, the overall assessment into what we do whenever we have all of the components along the treatment line, all the way from conservative treatments to injections to mild to fusion spacers to non-fusion spacers to laminectomy and to decompression fusion surgery. So this is just one of those things that if you ever get stuck, this is an algorithm that you can refer to. So bottom line, whenever we think stenosis, we think three, four, and four, five. Don't think one, two, or two, three, or five, one for the lumbar spine. The clinical presentation is classic. You can describe this. The difference between claudication and neurogenic claudication is they appear very similar. So the only thing that will maybe confuse you is vascular claudication. These words are the same. Um, a good rule of thumb, you don't need a, a scale. We don't need uh, to a grading uh, system. Just look for the presence or absence of fluid around the cauda equina for symptoms or absence of symptoms. Normally, it's going to be about 100 square millimeters or higher. When you get down to 85, that is absolute stenosis. If you want to measure it and multiply it by time, by pi, you can do that. And that's going to give you a good objective measurement because that's how it works for the AI algorithms, grading it mild, moderate, or severe. And uh, the distance is important, but it, it comes down to basically everybody is symptomatic at 85 square millimeters of stenosis. And with that, I'm going to stop right there, open it up for some questions and comments, and we will transition over here in a second to Ramo, who's going to be doing the vertiflex spacers in the lab. Pankaj. Yeah, um, click, click your uh, mic there. We all want to hear what you have to say. Can you hear me? Perfect. So I've had this question asked to me, and you know, there's, the answers have never been clear. But when you look at the, the um, MIDAS study for the um, mild procedure, basically the cutoff is 2.5 millimeters, and you can shave off that ligament. When you look at some of the radiologic literature, most radiologists are like, oh, it's 2.5 millimeters. Mm -hmm. So they don't consider it as a, something which is, needs to be resected. Mm -hmm. Like you mentioned, rightfully so, four millimeters is somewhere where every radiologist is comfortable calling it ligament hypertrophy, which may need attention by an interventionalist. So what is that correct number? Because the study says if you have 2.5 millimeters, you can go ahead and use a T-code and go ahead and shave that ligament off. We know that there is very weak correlation between what we see on the MRI and the symptoms. So um, do you have any comments on that? So anything more than two millimeters is, that's the threshold. So anything more than two millimeters is abnormal. And it doesn't really get to three and four millimeters until it gets at least moderate in terms of severity. So you have a four uh, millimeter thick ligament and flavum, that's always gonna be in something that's severe or moderate to severe. So anything more than two millimeters, you can trim it up, no problem. And you will find cases that the ligament and flavum will not be that hypertrophic. And so why is that? It's, it's less of a hypertrophy and more of a redundancy. So when you get a disc collapse, ligament and flavum goes like this. So it's a little bit more of a redundancy. So it depends on the shape of the disc. Does the person have, for example, a dish, diffuse adiabatic skeletal hyperostosis, where the disc doesn't really collapse, you get tremendous you know, hypertrophic facets that cause stenosis. So we're pretty lenient about this. So anything greater than two millimeters is abnormal and you can resect that to your heart's content. When you say that 5-1 um, is protected, 
uh, physiologically, what do you, why is that protected? What do you mean? It's the shape of the, of the uh, facet joints and the stability. So you have iliolumbar ligaments. That's number one. You typically have, uh, in conventional anatomy, you've got facets that are a little bit more horizontal than sagittal. You have the four or five, and the facets are more sagittally oriented. There's a lot more motion at four or five, typically. So five one just has more structural stability, stability. It has ancillary ligaments that actually hold it to the ilium. And so most of the motion will be at four or five. And based on that, and based on the configuration of the facet joints being more sagittally oriented, that's gonna be the area that, that decompress, that, that degenerates and starts to move and become spondylotic.